each and every one of you could be joining us. Um, my name is Ellie Demarchelier, and I'm really delighted to be facilitating today's launch of the Australian Psychosocial Alliance's NDAS Recovery Plan. This is part of our ongoing Australian Disability Dialogue Project, and it's great to have you all here today. We've had over 380 registrations for this event, which is amazing. I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we all gather and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. I'm joining in from the lands of the Yagara and Turrbal peoples, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I'm really looking forward to today's discussion because you are a section of the disability community that sometimes doesn't get the focus you deserve. Today is a chance to unpack the APA submission to the NDIS review and get a deeper understanding of the key recommendations and how they would improve lives. To assist us, I'd like to introduce our terrific panel. Jill Callister, CEO of Mind Australia. Hi, Jill. Deb Hamilton is a lived experience advocate and one of the pioneers of the consumer voice in Australia. Say hi, Deb. And Hello. Kerry Hawkins is a family member of someone with lived experience. Say hi, Kerry. Hello, everyone. During the course of the launch, we are going to stop for questions and reflections. Whether you're someone with lived experience of the NDIS or someone working in the sector, we'd love to know what you think. We recognise that not everyone here is necessarily going to agree with everything today. And that's actually something we really value. Better policies and lives come from us knowing what each other think and why. Let us know what you are thinking on the chat. We have Eleanor and Simon monitoring the chat and we really encourage you to share your thoughts. We only request that you keep it civil. Speaking of, civility is a tool that is going to help us uh, to collect feedback today, which you can use via the QR code on the screen right now or by hitting the link that we've put in the chat. This is really important because we're going to be using civility throughout today's uh, session to collect feedback. Um, but if you would prefer, of course, you can use the chat. We also have Maria and Ariane on tech support. So if you have any issues, just send them a message through Zoom. Jump on and hit the heart to let us know you're all good. Later, we'll be going through your thoughts on our recommendations. But to warm up, I'm interested in understanding what psychosocial disability means to you. I'm not talking about a technical definition. We know that is quite a term of art. Rather, I'm interested in some descriptive words that reflect your feelings when you think about either living with or caring for someone with a psychosocial disability disability. So um, if you put in some words into the civility tool now, you'll see them come up as a word cloud. Um, so Deb, from a lived perspective, what word would you choose? There's a big resilience currently sitting there, um, but what would you choose? Well, um, I probably don't really like the term psychosocial disability, so I would choose um, uh, us having a deeper understanding of disability and impairment and not concentrate on impairment when we're talking about psychosocial disability. So I would say worrying. Worrying. Okay. And Kerry, as a carer, what word would you put there? Mm, I'm with Deb on this one. Um, I see it more as a deprivation of citizenship the deprivation of citizenship. Interesting. And Jill, as a provider of services, what's the word you'd put there? Um, I, I put life because I could only put one, but I, I would put good life. So um, yeah. how you, you know, get past um, 
mental health challenges to go to what makes a good life. And so citizenship, I think, is a really important um, component of that. I see on there words like recovery, uh, community, um, vulnerability, misunderstood. Uh, it's moving so fast. We've got some great words coming through very quickly. Um, so we can see that people are really engaged. Uh, challenges, um, citizenship. Uh, so thank you everyone for um, getting involved. We'll be using the civility tool uh, throughout today's session. So make sure you keep it either on your phone, um, just in the background, it, that's the best way to um, keep it going. And you can also use the chat throughout the event uh, to make sure that you're staying, uh, you're able to continue to give us your feedback. Um, now we're going to move on to why we're here today. And I might hand over to Jill to give a bit of an overview of why we're here today, Jill. Thank you, Ellie. Um, and I'll just give a quick summary of, of why we're here. So this group of people, people who've um, experienced significant mental health challenges and may continue make up about 18% of NDIS scheme participants. And the APA may, is made up of seven organisations uh, that are not-for-profit organisations that are providing a range of different community-based supports for people who are participants in the NDIS scheme. Um, some of the APA organisations were actually started quite a long time ago by people with lived experience and their family members, and a number of APA members were deeply involved in the deinstitutionalisation movement that occurred in the last decades of the last century. In the main, our organisations came from the need to provide strong alternatives to institutions, a model that I think we all accept is dehumanising, disempowering and damaging for people. And we've all grown our commitment to lived experience approaches in mental health and have a strong commitment to employing peer practitioners in our frontline services and having board and senior leadership positions with lived experience throughout our organisations. So we're holding this event today as a public launch of the report, a recovery-shaped NDIS, which we did submit to the NDIS review. It's a substantial piece of work and it builds on the experience of more than a decade working with the NDIS. We know it's not the final word. We consulted um, across some parts of the sector in developing it, but it's also the start of a conversation with you and we're listening. We want the report to start a discussion on how the NDIS can better support people with psychosocial needs who are participants in it. And it's based on a simple proposition that we can design a support structure around people with psychosocial disabilities or needs for the, that are eligible for the scheme that reduces trauma, builds resilience and takes people on the road to recovery. The report has a range of recommendations that be, can be grouped under essentially three foundational ideas. We need better planning and supports that are flexible, that meet the needs of this group of participants and can be scaled up in times of need so that people can access them when they need the help most. They need to be strategic, not transactional, so that the focus is on that recovery journey and that we should always be led by the experts, people who have lived experience in this area. And we really don't want to see these ideas just sit in a pile of the thousands of submissions that will have been sent to the NDIS. And that's why we called this briefing today, so that we can begin to bring these ideas to life, not just as a policy paper, but as a story. And we want to share that story with you today so that you can become advocates for people across this sector. And we're all doing, right across um, the sector, doing it really innovative and transformational work. And the decisions that are made in the coming months as the government reviews whatever the review panel put to them will determine the extent to which this work can continue and 
the extent to which it can continue to grow in scale. I do think this review is a crossroads moment for the support of people who need the scheme. And we are keen to work across the sector to ensure that we all take the right track. Thanks, Sally. Thank you. So, Jill, I want to have a look at the blueprint um, which has been provided in a visual format. We'll put it on the screen right now. Can you talk us through this? Um, the, this is essentially a diagram that um, is how we envisaged as we compiled this submission, the participant journey. And what you can see in those seven key points through the journey is how we conceived of um, this group of participants in the scheme having a much more tailored and uh, coordinated approach through the scheme. And I think the most important thing I want to draw your attention to here, Ellie, is the spe specialist psychosocial recovery plans, that the entire journey commences at that point with something that is tailored around what this group um of participants actually start with. Great. Well, of course, this is not an academic challenge. It's a human one. It's about improving people's lives no matter what they have lived through. That's why the APA have produced an explainer video that is narrated by people with lived experience. This is going to be the world premiere, very exciting. So let's have a look. All right, we're having some technical issues at the same time that my dog is barking very loudly. It has to all happen at once, doesn't it? Um, we'll give the um, behind the scenes team a few more seconds to see if we can get the bugs out of the system. Um, Jill, how did this video come to be? We can't hear you, Jill. Yeah, no, sorry difficulty with mute doesn't it always happen um so uh this video came to be from uh people who um have lived experience of the scheme um who have both um positive experiences of the scheme but also are wanting to have the scheme better tailored to to what they need so um they were very keen to participate and talk about the scheme going forward, uh, their view about the scheme. All right. Well, let's see world premiere People if we can make it happen this time. Psychosocial disability can experience issues arising from mental health challenges. This can result in difficulties in other areas of our lives, such as the ability to think clearly, enjoy full health and good social and emotional well-being. We are people from all walks of life, friends, family members and neighbours. We face stigma, discrimination and all too often debilitating poverty, unemployment, homelessness and isolation because of our disability. We are all unique and have different goals and needs. Our disability fluctuates. Some days are worse than others. For decades, we've been calling for inclusion and more say in the decisions that affect our lives. We belong in the NDIS. But we also see an opportunity for the NDIS to change so that it really makes a difference in our lives. We have the knowledge and the expertise to design better supports that focus on genuine choice and control. Better planning and supports that can be urgently and easily scaled up in times of need and are flexible in response to change. 
ensuring our conditions don't escalate to the point of crisis. We don't want to have to relive our worst day just to get support or navigate multiple hurdles in times of need. Recognising that recovery comes from a coordinated plan to rebuild our skills and networks with a consistent support worker. Not just the delivery of individual disconnected services and understanding that we are the experts in our recovery journey and that the most important guides are others with lived experience. We want to work with people who understand us. That's why, along with the Australian Psychosocial Alliance, we're calling for an NDIS recovery Plan. A plan that sees us as experts in our own lives. Fantastic. That's wonderful. And a special thanks to the stars of our video. We really hope you will all be able to share that video on your network, uh, throughout your network. Um, it's incredible to have people with lived experience voicing that message. Um, we're now going to break the report's findings into four chunks and let our panel have a chance to reflect on each. First is the role of the NDIS. Secondly, planning and support. Thirdly, coordination of care. And finally, the critical importance of lived experience. Firstly, the foundational principle that psychosocial belongs in the NDIS. So Jill, What's the history of psychosocial disabilities being covered in the NDIS? Thanks, Sally. So when the NDIS was introduced, um, it was welcomed as a much needed system of support for those experiencing disability in Australia. And I think that we continue to embrace that vision. Uh, People with psychosocial needs uh, were not originally included in the initial conceptions of the scheme, but towards the end of the design process, um, this group did join the scheme, the scheme and, and that late addition was welcomed. But it also meant that um, people with psychosocial needs were uh, had to fit into the existing structures of the scheme. Um, inclusion of people living with psychosocial issues relating to their mental health was celebrated uh, within the sector um, and by those participants um, and their families. Um, I think that said, it was understood that um, this group may present some unique challenges for the scheme. But um, now 10 years on, with the scheme under review, it is an opportunity to evaluate how we don't just push people with psychosocial needs into the same structures and the same pathways and the same service models that are there for all the other participants in the scheme. And that's more or less what's happened up to now. So I think the review is something we should all welcome. But our starting point is that a psychosocial um, disability needs to remain in the NDIS. There were some people early on who questioned whether it should continue. And we've argued very, very strongly that this group of people have a right to remain in the scheme, um, but also not status quo. That the, the services for people need to be fit for purpose and fit um, much more strongly that notion of um, recovery. Okay, so on that, um, I guess, proposition, I want to ask Deb. Um, Deb, you're on this scheme. How has it changed your life? And do you agree with the idea that psychosocial disabilities should be on the scheme? Are you on, uh, your microphone is not on. Sorry, everyone. I just want to say as someone who has 
been on the NDIS from a trial site from right from the beginning. I've been a strong advocate uh, for the NDIS and I've been part of the National Register working on psychosocial disability and the NDIS that I'm really worried about this plan, Jill. And one of the things, the things that particularly worry me, um, well, first of all, I need to say that the NDIS has changed my life. I was homeless, I'd been fired from my job, I was sitting in a day centre and a service provider helped me out. But the thing that really changed my life was having an independent support coordinator. And I'm just a little bit worried about what this um, document is proposing. Um, so that, you know, I identify that having some independent, someone who knew about psychosocial disability and was able to uh, allow me choice and control of what services I got, I think is very important. And I don't see that coming through the document. Um, and I, I also worry about the fact that there's no help to access the NDIS in this document. And, you know, it's been very clearly identified through my research and others around the world, actually, that there's a real need for a follow through right from the access. So the NDIS has certainly changed my life and I would really strongly argue for the NDIS to remain in the NDIS, but it has to change a lot. Yes, I can hear that. Yeah. Um, I just am getting a comment through from um, Kyla, who says, thank you for the discussion today. As a psychosocial NDIS participant, I can only say how after my last 45 years of problems, I'm finally being acknowledged and now have help that is changing my life for the better. Mm -hmm. um, so very much like you, it did change her life. Kerry, can I ask you, the NDIS is built as a, build as a rights-based scheme. How does, does that align with the broader approaches to mental health and well-being? Um, I think there's a couple of elements to that question, Ellie. I mean, whilst it's billed as being a rights-based scheme, in reality it's not. It's not fit for purpose. I think there was promise and potential in terms of what it could have offered around acknowledging the deprivation of people's rights as citizens um, because the current uh, mental health system has been identified by everybody and their dog except for the Australian mental health system that it actually uh, doesn't, doesn't deliver people's rights and it actually takes or violates people's rights. At the moment, the United Nations Special Rapporteur was very clear uh, in a report in 2017 that the major issue facing the mental health systems around the world actually was a global burden of obstacles and those obstacles were biomedical psychiatry, biomedical psychiatry, biomedical psychiatry and various manifestations. So the NDIS was actually a promise for an escape from those systems that were imposed on people. I think it hasn't delivered. I think, you know, we've also been in the scheme since um, 2016. We were in a trial site as well. Uh, and it hasn't made any difference um, to our lives. And when I say our, I, I add into the conversation around citizenship the rights of families as well. Um, and so if, I think for many families, it possibly has made things worse. And certainly um, for us, that's been the case. Yeah. Um, just before we move on, I'm, I am interested, Jill, if you don't mind responding to Deb on the document itself. And it, Deb made the point that um, it doesn't have much, uh, I guess, uh, information in there about access and the and the struggle that there is to gain access. Um, and and other points. Do you do you mind responding to Deb on those thoughts? Sure. Um, I, I I I wouldn't want to get anyone to get the impression um, and happy to talk it through more, Deb, as well, that we would be recommending people wouldn't get in access to independent coordination. I think what we think is there needs to be more coordination. Um, I've been 
told so many, well, on multiple occasions by the NDIA that people with psychosocial or well, the psychosocial participants don't use their full plan so they don't need them. And I don't think that's true. I think it's very hard to navigate and you often, if you get a great coordinator or um, support coordinator as you've obviously had, you can get that access. But increasingly, people don't necessarily have that coordinator who knows much about mental health. They may be working across a really broad range of um, people in the scheme. And the particular, I, I think that was the second point you made that we would really agree with. A lot of the services in the scheme really do need to be delivered for, for this group of participants by people who do understand the sorts of issues that they are living with and dealing with. And that is different to dealing with families with young children with autism or people with other forms of disability challenges. And yet it all gets kind of um, thrown together quite often. So we think a specialist understanding of mental health is pretty important for a lot of the um, a lot of the services, not every service in the scheme, but a lot of the um, uh, types of services in the scheme. Uh, you know, I could give example after example, and I'm sure there are people who've had experiences of them, you know, with people with psychosocial disabilities living in houses provided by providers who have security guards out the front, who have people pay, paid, uh, you know, on basic wages delivering the support in the house with no mental health experience. And, you know, when issues come up, the police are called rather than um, someone to provide the kind of support that might help people not have that escalate. So I, I think we absolutely want people to have access to independence. I think we also want people to have access to specialist support. Mm -hmm. And as I keep saying, we think recovery, um, that focus on recovery is really critical. I probably haven't addressed all of what you said, Deb and or, or Kerry, but I'm conscious of time. And as I said Thank at the you, beginning, Jill. we're keen that this is the start of a conversation. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Now, what we're going to do now is go to what we call our traffic light system, which I love, and we'll go to time and time again. We're asking you, how do you feel about that proposition that's been put forward? Should psychosocial be included in the NDIS? Green is yes. Um, yellow is I'm really not sure there's there's concerns there and red is an absolute no. Um, so at the moment, green is far ahead. Yes, it should be on the NDIS 79%. Uh, there's some concern at 14% and there's uh, a couple of clear no's at 11%, but get your votes in. Um, I think it's, and if you can't use uh, the civility tool, use the chat tool to let us know. Uh, Jerry just said green. Uh, uh, Di Diane just said green. Melanie said green. Um, so I can see your votes coming in that way as well. Um, yellow and red are currently tied on 14%, but green is by far ahead on 71% that psychosocial should still be in the NDIS. So, um, but I think there is, I think we could all agree it could be done better and the status quo is not good enough. Um, so on that note, let's look at the second recommendation of the report. Um, I'd like to introduce Cathy um, Borum, the CEO of One Door, to take us through the next set of recommendations regarding planning and support. Over to you, Cathy. Thanks, Ellie. And, and hi, everyone. It's fantastic to have about, I think we're about 204 people across Australia joining us. And I'd like to say thank you for that. Um, and uh, I, I must say to the colleagues um, in the APA and also to to our staff and more importantly, to the people we support in all our organizations. This has come from um, all the voices there and I acknowledge the different voices that are out in the sector. And it's wonderful that we can have this dialogue today around that. Um, what we're bringing out in terms of the piece that I'm talking about in terms of our report is that we want people with psychosocial disability 
um, uh, reflecting to us that there needs to be flexibility in the NDIS so that their supports can either be urgently scaled up as needed or when things are going okay, it can go back to um, something that they need which is tailored to their individual recovery needs. So we want to be able, we've recommended to the NDIA that this is, um, this is a scheme that is flexible um, and that people aren't worried that they're gonna lose their package if they're not utilizing them because they're going okay. And we think that this is really crucial um, to ensuring people's um, conditions, things that are happening for people don't escalate to the point of crisis that then is leading to things like emergency department or mental health admissions. Um, and so we really want to um, see that the NDIS recognises the reality that we all have fluctuations and things um, change in our lives. And so what our report or our blueprint is calling for is that plans are personalised, they're, they're evidence-based and outcomes driven, um, that they are integrated and they're like looking at the whole of the person um, in, and really involving families or their support systems to work out what is their recovery journey um, and making sure that that is um, an integrated uh, plan that is uh, really worthwhile and is taking into consideration all the things that is going on for that person. We are recommending that it's um, there's flexible funding options that can be scaled up and down. Um, and also one of the big ticket items is that there's longer plans, but with more regular check-ins. So um, wouldn't it be great to see uh, not having 12 months reviews all the time, but having it to be a longer thing based on uh, what's happening for somebody. Um, so yes, they're the key things in terms of the flexibility. And I think all the, the carers and um, consumers that um, come to one door, that's a, a rather large part of uh, what they'd like to see as part of the changes to the NDIS. Thank you so much, Cathy. Um, Carrie, I'm interested on planning and support. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the importance of flexing in support? Yeah, um, and I, I think just to Cathy's point around the consistent experience people have had of not using uh, the supports or the funding allocated in their packages and then an assumption it's because they don't need them rather than the reality, which is they're not appropriate or there's not the right supports for people, is a critical one that has to has to get addressed. Um, we don't often talk enough about um, trauma and the system can and does continue to harm people because of that inappropriate structural violence around telling people what they need and don't need. I think um, the other the other thing I'm interested in pursuing much, much more is being genuine um, around uh, the flexibility of supports that's required and framing it again rather than a personal recovery journey around what's missing from people's lives in, in order for them to be fully, you know, as rights holders, um, fully citizens. So what's stopping, what are the obstacles in the way for regaining employment if that's where you're feeling like you're at? We know that um, overseas the evidence base, particularly coming out of the States, for example, is that people can pretty much use their funds for whatever. If they live in an unsafe neighbourhood, then they get rent assistance to move somewhere else and moving fees are paid. If they have dental um, issues, often because of long-term use of medications, they can have their teeth fixed, for example, if they need to reconnect with their family, then they can have funds to spend to go visit with their family. So they can have gym memberships. So it's that kind of flexibility that I think we need far more of. And above all and over everything else, we know consistently that individuals and families live in poverty. And somehow we've kind of dropped the ball on the fact that regate or finding ways out, social mobility and finding ways out of poverty including cash transfers, which are evidence-based in, you know, there are lots of studies going on around this, is something that needs to be on the radar. We just need to be able to think differently about what we're calling evidence-based and what we're justifying. The flexibility has to be pretty much anything that's required in order for people to regain citizenship. Thank you. Um Cathy, we've just had a question in the chat from Jo. Uh, she says, in plan review meetings, planners are arguing that the NDIS do not fund what ifs, i.e. fluctuations. Um, have you heard the same? And what do you say to that? And 
and what what does the APA report say to that? Um, I think it's in um, going back to what uh, Jill was talking about at the beginning around um, the specialised recovery plan and, and being able to talk through that. I think it's being able to have those regular touch points. It's also being able to have um, the specialist input to that. And I think rather than a stop and, and kind of um, let go, but there needs to be these regular touch points about it. And I think it's been, we've had some dialogue with the agency and the review team around this, and they've acknowledged that flexibility needs to be in the system. How it's going to look, I'll leave it up to the mechanisms of them, but I think it's it's promising that the current system doesn't support it, but I think there is a future way that they could look at supporting it in uh, moving forward. And Deb, if you could change one thing about your plan or how plans are structured, what would it be? I think that um, flexibility as the as the um, as the document captures is um, very important because everyone fears that they'll lose money in their plan. But you know the. The one thing I'd change is the culture of VNDIS and their understanding of um, psychosocial disability and how we're treated. So mm -hmm. if I was going to change anything in the plan, the plan would be how the plan is made. Fair enough. And, how and can I say can I say that's felt broadly across the disability community? I know that's specific to this this group of people it, it may be experienced more or heightened but I can tell you it's experienced across the disability community. Well, well Ellie it's a little bit different than that for people with psychosocial disability because the evidence from systematic reviews overseas about personalised budget screens and my own um, research shows that in fact the NDIS traumatises people it makes yes. their situation worse. So it's not just a little thing, it in fact impairs further the very people who the scheme is supposed to help. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. Um, Kathy, can I ask you, wouldn't it actually save money if the focus was on support and intervention before a moment of crisis? Um, absolutely, and um, Ellie, and I think, and I concur with what um, Deb was saying um, around the culture and the NDIS, and I think it goes back to that design scheme piece as well, um, Deb. Mm -hmm. um, we know any early intervention and doing things earlier saves um, saves money, um, and but I think it's bigger than just about saving money. I think this is uh, speaking to Kerry's point. This is about not re-traumatizing. This is this is about uh, qual uh, people's qualities of life um, and, and this is about them um, being able to continue to move forward and not have the worry about how they're, they're going to cope through the various things. So any intervention at any early stage is always worthwhile, uh, not just from a financial perspective, from a whole of life um, much. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, we're going to go to the traffic lights now. How do people feel about the propositions that have been made around flexible planning and support? Um, oh, well, it's even more overwhelming uh, green support here. 94% say green. Uh, we have 9% say red. And let me just say, for anyone who's voting yellow or red, this is the start of the conversation. We want to hear why you have concerns about it. Um, please put your thoughts um, in the chat if you're voting yellow or red. We actually really want to hear why you're voting yellow or red. Um, it would be really interesting to know. So if you're one of the 8% um, that are voting yellow or red, please tell us why. Um, we'd be really keen to know. But, yes, overwhelmingly green at over 90%. So, um we want more flexibility in our, the supports and the planning. Um, to the next group, the next uh, trench of suggested improvements is to look at coordination and capacity. Um, I'm going to ask Drika Vandermeer um, 
to look at coordination and capacity from uh, to talk us through the thinking on this important issue. Drikas is from Stride Mental Health. Um, over to you, Drikas. Thank you, Ellie, and much appreciate the opportunity to have a conversation about the submission and really talk through the ideas that, that we have and how we can be better advocates for those who, um, who we support throughout the system. Um, we truly understand that um, when it comes to planning and capacity, coordination and capacity, that it is truly about the needs of the individual, that we really need to work around a plan that, that is ab about the individual, that truly supports the individual, and that we want a scheme that recognises that that coordinated plan to rebuild that skills and its works requires a consistent support worker, requires somebody that's really trained, requires somebody who is going to be there all the time and really understands the situation. And that's that um, need for that consistency and that individual and that independence from the services that's being provided to the um, participant to ensure that there's actually somebody that can advocate for them when things get difficult and things get complicated. And we want to ensure that it stays there. Um, there was a little graph that I was hoping that would be popped on the screen. There we go. Um, and there was a lot of question about recovery coach. And I think that um, the recovery coach is such a key element of the, the, our efforts going forward with the NDIS, but it's part of a, a greater and big um, holistic support that, that um, the participant requires. And when you look at the complexity of that, making sure that we have somebody that really understands psychosocial support, sitting there with a psycho, uh, psychosocial support coordinator is somebody that understands it, understands the complexity of this, and is really there to assist with the building of a team that provides that holistic and specialized recovery oriented support. Um, for the participant there and really refocuses the services to incorporate that capacity building dedicated to increasing the independence and the skills of the individual. And that's really what we want to put in the submission is ensuring that that support coordination that's there is really someone that is well trained, understands mental health and is there to help um, really support that holistic support that's required for the for the participant and incredibly so also ensuring that when there's flex, um, a need of an uh, of, as um, Kathy was just mentioning before a change of need of support that there's somebody that actually understands what that means and also somebody that can help with the planning around that that really understands what's going on thank you thank you so much um, Deb, I'm really interested to know the role of a support coordinator. I know in my plan, which is, um, you know, I have uh, different needs, obviously, but the role of a support coordinator is crucial. For you, the, what's the importance of a support coordinator? How important is that role? I think it's essential in that it... Oh. Yeah, I think it's essential in that it um, is the pivotal point for people to get services that are appropriate. And um, I agree with the fact that it would be great if that person had a good understanding of psychosocial uh, disability. And, um, and But one of the things uh, that I worry about is that this sort of plan feels a bit rigid. I know that people will be asked, but that in a sense, these things might be imposed on someone when the very act that the NDIS is based on talks about choice and control. Yeah. Okay, Jill, are you there? Would you like to quickly respond to that? Um, yes, I am here. Um, Deb, it, it shouldn't come across, it's not intended to come across as ridiculous. But, but I understand, you know, reading a document and, and that's framed as a submission and a, and a piece of kind of policy from which then to, as I said at the beginning, bring it to life can, you know, people will read many things into it. Um, so that's helpful feedback because it, it's not meant to, mm. to be rigid. We, the only other thing I'd say is, 
choice and control is important and it is a, is a key part of the scheme. Um, and we, we see people sometimes exploited by, by workers who don't have much interest in recovery, do have an interest in providing an hour and a half of service because that's what they'll be paid for, um, do have an interest in perhaps not causing harm, but not being particularly interested in the overall picture for um, someone and the journey they're on, um, is just interested in that hour and a half and going away and doing the next thing they do. So I think what we were trying to look at was how we make sure that you marry all these different important and sometimes competing um, propositions to get the scheme to be more responsive to the needs of people with, with mental health issues. And if that's come across as rigid, I'm sorry, because it's not intended to. I guess that's right. why this is the beginning of a conversation. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's why the, this feedback is so important and why I encourage everyone to use the chat and to keep giving us their feedback and what they're reading into this. Um, thanks, Deb. Thanks, Jill, for answering. Kerry, I'm interested in how your experience would have been better if the focus on capacity building was the norm rather than the exception. Mm, um, I, I think a couple of uh, things come to mind, Ellie, with that question. I think the first thing um, to preface my answer is by saying that um, uh, two things about support coordination. One, um, it presumes supports. Uh, and I, I live in Western Australia. And I would say that for the vast majority of people, particularly in the northwest of Western Australia and other, other rural and remote places, the supports don't exist. <laughs> um, the services don't exist. And so I think we need to be thinking more about resource brokers rather than necessarily support coordinators who might be looking to build capacity in a person. I think the other, the other fundamental issue for me around this is that the presumption is that um, it's individuals that we need to be fixing. And I think for mental health in particular, this presumption around impairment hasn't been examined enough. I don't think impairment is necessarily the right word to use and that we should actually be looking much more at in the true model of social disability, of disability, looking at capacity building the environment, which as a family member, I think is particularly important that we should have had um, far more resources to support our existence as a family, including children. Children's voices often are completely missed in these conversations because of positioning around consumer and carer. Um, so yes, we need a skilled workforce. I, I just think that we absolutely need a fundamental rethink around what it is that people need moving forward. Yeah, yes, I hear that. So we're going to go to the traffic lights now. How do people feel about the recommendations on our coordination and capacity building that Drake has ran us through? Um, we have 62% uh, green. There's some concern here um, that I'm seeing 29% yellow and 10% red. Um, if we had time, I would open up uh, to more to answering people's questions, but I'm really wanting people to put their concerns um, into the chat. There's people there talking amongst, you know, answering people's questions. Um, from APA, uh, there's a discussion going on. We are collecting the chat concerns. Um, so please put your concerns in the chat. It's not going un unregistered. Um, we will have the chat after this session has finished to go through and uh, keep as a source of people's concerns. So please do that. Um, it really means a lot if you put your concerns into the chat. Um, uh, I am going to have to move on to our final um, area of uh, recommendations, which is I'll, I'm going to ask Jill back to talk about the needs to refocus on the scheme that is designed and led by the experts, people with lived experience. Um, Jill. Um, thank you, Ellie. Uh, I'm not sure if, yeah, we are putting up... Um... This is one of the uh, diagrams out of the report, and it's part. It's 
uh, called Pathways to a Well-Equipped um, Psychosocial Disability Lived Experience Workforce. Uh, so this goes to the heart very much of having people with lived experience in the workforce. Drake has mentioned uh, recovery coaches. Um, they haven't we think recovery coaches are really important and we put that in the report, but they need to be um, remunerated at the same level as uh, support coordinators because the role function is almost exactly the same. And um, th they need to um, be supported and encouraged to be part of um, the workforce. In the um, supported accommodation space, the NDIA will only fund um, SHADS 2 level frontline workers. We pay our peer workers at a SHADS 3 level, but that isn't rec recognised in the funding model. So there's a range of things that we would um, argue need to happen to build, train and supervise um, a peer support workforce, um, co-design uh, the implementation of psychosocial recovery plans and integrate peer skills and evaluate um, evaluation programs into recovery alongside that recognition that this workforce, you don't get them on the cheap, so to speak. Thanks, Jill. Um, so Deb, you were one of the first peer support workers in Australia. How has this role changed over time? It's changed tremendously and people going into hospitals and working in uh, uh, non-government organisations are much more skilled than I ever was. And uh, as um, Jill was saying, um, they should be um, remunerated as such, their skill isn't recognised. I'd just say that um, it'll be good for us in the lived experience community to come together with the service providers and really have another look at this plan and see how we can work together to, I think, um, improve it uh, as a team. Uh, the other thing is that um, I worry about, uh, one of the things, I've just done some consultations with people um, around the NDIS review and people were very concerned that peer workers working with people on the NDIS should actually be NDIS participants themselves because they felt that it's such a, a world of its own dealing uh, with the NDIS and service providers compared to uh, other peer workers. So that's just something that they said. But it, I really look forward to us all sitting down and nutting some of the crunches out because I think the plan has many merits. Mm. Thank you, Deb. Now we're going to go to the traffic lights, but before we devote or do anything, I really want to clarify what the traffic lights mean. The vote is just to get a feel of the room on just your senses of where we're heading. It's not a formal endorsement of the plan. We just want to get a sense of what you're thinking, if we're headed in the right direction, if you're agreeing with what we're talking about, there's no formal endorsement of the plan here. You're not, we're not releasing this as some kind of 73% agree with us. It's just to get a feel of the room. So please be reassured of that. Um, so greater focus on lived experience. Um, we've got 78% in green, 17% uh, yellow and 4% red. I'd really love to know the 24% in yellow and red, what your concerns are with a greater focus on lived experience. Um, because in my whole time as a disability advocate, I've never, uh, there's never been anything wrong with having more lived experience at the table, but um, I'm keen to know your ideas and thoughts and feedback um, because maybe you're thinking of something I haven't, um, which is probably the case and I'd love to hear it. So if you have any concerns, uh, please let me know in the chat. Um, at this point, I, I'd really love to be able to say we could open it up for a full chat, but our time has gone quickly. I want to know, um, uh, 
no one gets all of their policies up, but if we were to imagine ourselves in a decade, what would success look like, Jill? Uh, I think um, success would be um, a scheme that um, all the participants in the scheme and their families felt was um, meeting their needs and helping them live the life they're choosing to lead and help live and the life they want. Um, that this wasn't just about mental ill health, it was about a good life and that we were organised, the scheme was organised for that. I also, you know, in the short term, want to make sure that it's also um, the people with um, psychosocial needs aren't discriminated out of particular parts of services. So, you know, for example, supported independent living where uh, more recently the um, NDIA had taken the view that it's not necessary for this group because they they don't have a sort of acute needs in on a 24-7 basis in the same way as they think about people with more physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. And I think um, uh, some of those things are, are really, really critical in thinking about uh, uh, the future. What about you, Deb? What will success look like for you in the future? You just go to Kerry first and I'll come back to me. <laughs> All right, Kerry. <laughs> Thanks, Deb. <laughs> um, success. Uh, look, I think um, <laughs> it would look like uh, people with uh, lived experience, including family members, uh, designing the scheme, not being called in at the last minute <laughs> to provide the um, expert panel with their perceptions or, or even being framed just as support workers. I think... Um, what it would look like for individuals and their families would be just a normal life, like with um, an average income rather than living below the poverty line with friends, everybody having, you know, ordinary relationships, ordinary homes and jobs. Um, I don't think we measure those what I would call elements of citizenship enough and I think that's where we need to be heading. All right, did that give you enough time, Deb? It did, it did. Um, what I will say is that um, uh, there are many people who have severe impairments and so severe impairment effects, and it's very important that they get the services that they need so that they can strive towards and have citizenship. And uh, I think we need to uh, make sure that people get the support they need and that they don't get thrown out with the bathwater like stopping sill. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you so much. All right, with our last minute, Jill, I'm going to ask you, what do you want us to do now? Thanks, Ellie. And thank you to everybody for um, spending the time today and for participating so actively in the chat. It's incredibly helpful. As I said at the beginning, this, this group of participants in the scheme have barely been talked about over the last nine months. This review's been underway, in fact, for 10 months, and this group's barely been talked about. Um, and that was one of the things we were trying to activate, elevate the issues, activate um, the sector, uh, and engage with people. So I'm really grateful uh, to my co-panellists uh, and to um, Ellie and to all of you who are participating. So we have some great assets that we need to turn into a living, um, breathing advocacy campaign. So um, you can sign up to the website. Uh, we need to build a list of people that we can continue to engage with and activate. Share our video with your community. Uh, link your organisation to our website. Uh, encourage your staff to view the video of today's discussion. Um, it's been a great summary, I think, of our um, starting position. Tell us what we need to have further conversations about. We want to listen. Mm -hmm. We would welcome uh, further discussion. But for now, the critical thing, I think, is to get everyone on the same page about some key messages, that psychosocial participants belong in the NDIS that flexible supports and a focus on recovery are important, that team coordination is important, and that being led by the experts, people with lived experience, is absolutely critical.
critical. Um, most organisations have relationships with their local MPs, both state and federal. Make sure they understand uh, what this vision is, what your vision is, and how critical it is that this group have a right to continue participating in the scheme going forward. As I said, I think the psychosocial sector and the disability that people participating in the scheme has been invisible too long, both the people we work with and the services we deliver. They haven't been discussed publicly enough in this big review. And I think this is the beginning of shining the light on this important work. Um, Ellie, it's been a great discussion. And mm -hmm. I think uh, it opens up possibilities for new and interesting dialogues. And I really particularly want to thank Deb and Kerry um, for participating and for their um, thoughtful and wise words. Uh, I yeah. think they are, they are great advocates. And thank you to you too, Jill. Um, thank you to all our panellists. Before we go, we quickly have three specific questions for you. We just want to know, uh, did you find the session in, uh, can we get our civility up? Um, did you find the session informative? Did you find the session engaging? And would you like to attend to future events? So if you're using that civility app, you can use the sliding tool to let us know how you found today. Uh, if you have any final thoughts, please enter them into the tool after the event as well. It will be really valuable for us planning future events. Thank you for your time and have a terrific day. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.